Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, let me make sure I got everything going here before we get this webinar started. It looks like we got a good group in today. If uh, if you can hear me and see me okay and see the screen, the screen should say backyard birds and have a little kingbird on a perch. Uh, feel free to shoot me over Q&A. Okay, Russ Nordstrand says he can hear and see me, so that's great. All right, we'll go ahead and get started on this. Let me get everything kind of where I need it to be. Hey, again, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Russell Graves. Uh, if you've been here before, you know I'm regular at giving these webinars, especially here lately. It seems like I've been giving one about every couple of weeks. Uh, if you're new to this webinar format that we do here at Backcountry Journeys, welcome, everybody. Uh, glad you made it. And so let's go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Russell Graves. I'm coming to you live right now from uh, my temporary office here in Bonham, Texas, but I'm originally from, I'm from Dodd City, Texas, where hopefully by the next webinar, I'll be doing it from my home office there. And uh, if you want to check out what I do, you can check out Russell at Russ or check out my website at russellgraves.com. Now, why backyard birds? You know, uh, in the, at the first of my photography career, I'd always go out looking for animals. I never would try to concentrate what I had in my own backyard. But after up until two or three or maybe four or five years ago, I think it was, I started really kind of focusing on birds that were just coming to my backyard because I live, I've always lived out in the country and you'd see all kinds of birds just hanging around the house. And so I made it a point to try to start building my portfolio of just nothing but backyard birds. So through this presentation today, I'm going to talk to you about backyard birds and why the, you know, this first slide here, why you should focus on them. Secondly, I'll give you some strategies on on not only how to focus on them from a photography standpoint, but also some biological facts that you can marry with your photography to help increase your success. Third thing, I'm going to show you a short video towards the end to kind of help it uh, help it all make sense. I got a, uh, before I get going, I've got a question here is that Jerry says not getting audio. Should I leave and try again? Jerry, you might, you might try that. Uh, it seems like we're working okay so far. Now, and Jerry brings up a good point. As I go through this today, I want this to be a dialogue and not a monologue. And so, hang on one second. There we go. So as we, so as we go through this today, I want this to be a dialogue and not a monologue. So if you have questions, just pop it in the Q&A and uh, I'll answer them as they come along. So, why backyard birds? Well, it's all pretty simple. Backyard birds are always close to home, you know, and the cool thing about birds is, is, is as the seasons change, like right now uh, around my house that we're still in the process of building, that we are, uh, we're getting a whole new set of birds starting to come in. Spring's coming on, winter hopefully is behind us, and then so we're getting a whole new crop of birds, and so as the year goes on, We'll have that same standard group of birds that don't migrate anywhere, but as the year goes on, we'll have more and more birds come into the house and, uh, and, and we'll be able to enjoy them not only just from a bird watching standpoint, but also from a photography standpoint. So that close to home is really important. And I'll tell you why here in just a second. Uh, second thing, they're usually pretty easy to attract. We'll get into some strategies here in a minute on how you can attract more birds, excuse me, to your backyard, but they're easy to attract generally. They don't need a whole lot of uh, uh, they don't need a whole lot of things to be able to get them to come fairly close uh, in your backyard, and this is the reason why that I think it's most important. It's easy to practice on, you know. If you have a constant source of photographic subjects in your own backyard, you don't have to travel far. It doesn't take a lot of effort to get your camera out. And really, whenever I'm leading a workshop or or a tour somewhere, one of the things that I talk to people a lot is the importance of practice. I mean. Every, I, I, I'm convinced everyone can become a great photographer. Uh, the technology and the tools are there for us today to be able to become really, really, really good. But the thing it always takes, like it does in any other activity in which you may partake, it's going to take practice. And so backyard birds, just the ability to practice and practice almost every single day if you want to, uh, that's, a, that's a great opportunity that, that backyard birds provide. So... Before we go any further, a little bit of a biology lesson, and I'm going to break these down 
of the five things that wi all wildlife species needs to thrive. And you can include yourself in this list as well. And so as I go from here, I'll kind of break down uh, each one of these individually, talk a little bit more about each one individually and uh, give you a few photography strategies that you can do to take advantage of each one of these five things that wildlife needs to thrive. The first one, obviously, is food. Uh, you know, all wildlife, including me and you, we need food to survive. Second thing is water. And these five things I'm going to mention, without, without regard to species, all species of animals need these same, these same things. Cover. I'll get a little bit more specifics in a minute about cover and what that means. But cover is typically, if, if we're put in people perspective, cover is the house you live in or just some way to get out of the weather and be able to survive times of bad weather. You need space. Uh, if the pandemic taught us one thing, people talk all the time about uh, being cramped in small areas. We all need space to survive and wildlife is no different. And then arrangement. So what the what that means, it's a little more nebulous. Uh, the arrangement refers to the way that the first four are in relation to one another. And again, all these five things is what this the basis of this talk is built upon. So we'll get into each one of them uh, one at a time. So the first one, obviously, back to food. You know, and this one kind of goes you, you hear in photography circles you hear various comments on whether or not it's ethical to feed wildlife. Uh, some say it is, some say it's not. Me, I, I I think we can be a benefit to animals if we provide supplemental feed for them. And so uh, you can provide bird seed or hummingbird or like hummingbird feeders. One thing I've never really tried as far as a backyard bird photography is concerned is doing a lot of uh, hummingbird photography, but this year I plan to change that. Uh, so if you're in the if you're in the camp like I am and you think it's OK to feed and I think it's OK to feed, I think there's a lot of uh, biological reasons that says feeding is acceptable and feeding can be beneficial to wildlife. You know, I'll, I'll back up a little bit on this. And, and uh, there was a, uh, a famous biologist back in the 40s named Aldo Leopold and Aldo Leopold was a noted conservationist of his time. And he wrote a book that's seminal to a lot of wildlife you know, and a lot of wildlife conservation circles called the Sand County Almanac. And in that book, he argued that the four things that were used or actually five things that were used to destroy wildlife populations can also be used to uh, to build them back up again. And those things are the the cow. And he talks about how uh, lot, the livestock industry traditionally uh, pushed all the wildlife out in favor of cattle. But you're starting to see some changes on ho holistic grazing approaches that really kind of make it a, a place on some of these agricultural lands where livestock and wildlife can coexist. And if you go the place with, the, with, with which I'm most familiar is western Texas, and you'll see a whole lot of ranchers who are taking wildlife conservation serious for economic reasons. And but they still have cattle to run on their place and they show models that you can do both successfully. So the cow, the axe and the axe refers to how we cut timber down. And so modern biology has shown that even with modern timber management and in and advanced timber management and taking out select trees, not taking out all the trees, clear cutting, but taking out select trees from an ecosystem, you can actually benefit wildlife species while having a sustainable harvest. So the cow acts plow and the plow refers to uh, plowing, wholesale, out, wholesale plowing of the plains used to take place and all these clear cutting uh, these river bottoms to be able to plow and pr plant food, uh, but how the plow can be used to uh, not only uh, increase wildlife populations from planting food and crops that are that are beneficial to wildlife, but also how, again, sustainable practices can be implemented that actually can feed people and benefit wildlife. So the cow, axe, plow, fire is the fourth one. And fire, uh, again, refers to how fire was suppressed and creates all these ecological problems that I think we see coming home to roost today when fire is suppressed. But fire can be used as a regenerative tool for wildlife. And then uh, the fifth one that, that was mentioned after the fact, I don't know that Aldo Leopold mentioned it, was the gun and how historically uh, hunting was market hunting was used to the wildlife's detriment. But today, using modern conservation methods, uh, hunting can actually increase wildlife populations. So now I'm not an advocate, especially if you live in town from a from a backyard bird photography standpoint of two of those, of course you can't 
burn in your backyard necessarily and, and you can't you know use a gun or hunt to control wildlife populations but the same concepts with a cow and axe and plow and be able to manipulate how your yard is used and how uh, you can manipulate wildlife populations in your own backyard that's definitely possible so with that in mind you can provide food or bird seed like hummingbird feeders and this is a big thing and this is one of the things we have in our landscape plan at the new house we're building you can do garden plantings that attract wildlife. There's all kinds of host of, of plants that uh, are are would not only provide food for wildlife, but also, I mean, birds, but also pollinators and all kinds of other critters that come around. And so towards the end of this presentation, I will share with you a, a resource that you can look at if you're interested in, in having one of those backyards that are just maybe not a certified wildlife habitat, but wildlife habitat that attracts all kinds of animals to your backyard. Uh, I'll share that link with you at, towards the end of this presentation. And so there's a couple of strategies you can use to help increase bird populations in your backyard. And so, again, this talk today, we're going to talk about strategies to increase bird birds and, and, and wildlife activity in your backyard, which, you know, I'm assuming everyone in the group knows a, a lot about photography. And so you can marry those two skills together. And we'll talk about some specific strategies as it applies for, to photography as we get into this a little bit. Now, all these pictures I'm showing you were actually taken all in uh, either my backyard proper or just right on the fringes of my backyard because my, in my old house I lived in, uh, in Northwest Texas, we had our backyard proper that we kept like any other suburban backyard, although we lived in the country. We kept the grass fairly low and kept it manicured. But as we got further and further away from the house, we, I let it grow a little bit wilder and wilder. So we had our, our, our yard proper just right around our house, but right on the fringes of our yard. I'd really try to manage for uh, wildlife and try to manage for, for food species to, that would attract birds. And so all these pictures you see were all taken uh, either right in my backyard or on my backyard proper. And again, I'll show you proof in a minute of how a lot of this worked. So the second thing is uh, you can help wildlife providing your own back you can help provide wildlife in your own backyard to increase the number of animals that come to your backyard is water and then like the slide says here you can provide water on demand for for birds uh in the example for the example i give bird bass bird waters or backyard ponds all three are great ways to uh increase the number of animals you're going to have in your yard because what you're going to see is not only will birds use it but also honeybees which if you've read anything about honeybees these days, their, their populations are a little bit in trouble uh, because a lot of them are dying off in wholesale, but the honeybees will use it. And all kinds of animals will start to use that water because water is really one of the uh, limiting factors when it comes to wildlife habitat, not only, not only in places where you get plenty of water, but also the rest of the country. And then this is a key thing, keep the water fresh at all times. And just like on the food, you know, uh, You'll want to keep the food fresh at all times, just like you keep the water fresh at all times. So the more you change it out, the more the, the wildlife gets acclimated to come and visiting those water sources. So Shelly asks, what's the long tail bird? Uh, I think the bird you're talking about is in this slide, Shelly. It's, it's in the lower right. That is a uh, scissor-tailed flycatcher. And that's the state bird of Oklahoma, if you didn't know that. But that's a scissor-tailed flycatcher we're looking at there. catch up to where I was. Believe it or not, that picture of the turkey drinking right there, that was in my in my backyard where I used to live. And uh, what I repli what I built there, it can be replicated at my new house, which I plan to do. But I'll show you a little more about that later. And then the third thing we talked about today is cover. And again, gets a little more nebulous in terms of food's pretty easy to understand. Water's pre pretty easy to understand. But what is cover? And so birds need cover for roosting, nesting, and loafing. So, of course, different birds nest in different places. Some nest in trees. Others nest on the ground. Some may like nesting in rocks. So it's, it, it's, this is all dependent on the area in which you live, on what birds you have there in terms of how they, how they roost. But they need, they need cover for nesting. Roosting, which is where they're going to sleep. Again, some birds sleep up in trees. Other birds may sleep on the ground. And then the third thing, a term you may not have heard of before, but loafing. Just like you need a place to go sit from time to time just to rest for a little bit, 
birds need that too. And so if, if you can provide food that checks these boxes for the roosting, nesting and, and loafing cover, then you're well on your way. And so one of the key things that I try to do a lot is uh, this is a good photography point here. You can add loafing cover around your yard so to help them access the food and water they need by just adding perches. And a lot of these pictures that you'll see, well, let me, I'm going to back up a second. So the, the titmouse in the upper right of this frame, that was actually a, a, just a dead tree I'd stuck in the ground and made that perch for them. And oops, I went too far back. And the scissor tailed flycatcher there on the lower right. Uh, this is kind of nerdy, but I did it anyway. I went and found some old barbed wire and I made me a perch between two posts that those birds could land on because I thought it'd be cool to get pictures of birds landing on a barbed wire like that. And so that's, and, and I, I was, and by doing so, I was able to manipulate my background because if you heard me talk before about uh, any kind of wildlife photography, I really try to pay attention to the backgrounds. And so by uh, putting that wire where I wanted it to, I could take advantage of the morning and evening light and be able to put the background where I need it to. And, you know, you can do a technique like this, whether it's a dead limb or whether it's a piece of barbed wire or really anything else, you can, you can do that in just about any backyard, I would imagine. And so by adding that wire, that's what I did is I, I added it for loafing cover. So when those birds would, you know, if I, if I had a feeder out, when those birds would go to feed on the feeder, they'd always fly away and just sit nearby to let other birds have their turn, number one. But number two, just to kind of to, to not not digest their feed because different birds digest their feed in a different way. But, for example, uh, like chickens, chickens will eat a bunch of feed up at one time. Chickens aren't wildlife, of course, but give you an example of a bird that, you know, turkeys do the same thing. They'll eat up a bunch of feed at one time. And then they'll have to go rest for a second because it goes into a, 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 a body part called the crawl. And then that's where they'll kind of, they store it in the crawl. Then they start the digestion process once it's in the crawl. And to do that, they just have to go sit somewhere for a while. And so prov by providing that loafing cover, whether it's uh, artificial limbs you put in place or limbs that you bring in, or whether it's a piece of barbed wire fence or something else, just gives them a place to rest when they're not actively feeding. And then there, I mentioned it again, that perches can be made of all kinds of stuff, old fence posts, rocks, any other kind of natural material that will really enhance uh, uh, the pictures you're trying to take. I know I've seen pictures on the webinars of people taking backyard bird photos and they're great photos, but one way they can always be improved if the bird is sitting on something natural. And so by providing some kind of cover like that in your backyard, whether you're going to try to do a whole scale landscape plan and change your landscaping to really adapt and to be beneficial to wildlife, or whether you're just adding perches for them to sit on. Think, think about that. Think about adding your own perches and, uh, and, and think about the natural aspect and how you want your picture to ultimately look and think about the backgrounds. And that way you can put perches where you want them, create the kind of backgrounds that you think you'd like to have. And then, uh, and then be able to shoot pictures as those birds land on those spots and then fly off. This is kind of a lazy way to do it. But one of the things I've started doing is having uh, a single perch near a feeder and I'll pre-focus my lens on it and just sit there and take a picture with a remote control while I'm doing something else. Anytime a bird lands on that and that way I don't have to necessarily look to the camera. I can just remotely fire my camera. Uh, Pat says that's a beautiful colored bird. Does anyone know what that is? What kind of bird that is, by the way? I'll give you a couple of seconds to chime in. I don't know how common they are across the rest of the state, but these are pretty common in Texas. I mean, across the rest of the country, but these are pretty common in Texas in the, uh, in the spring. I'll go ahead and spill the beans on it since no one's answering. It's a painted bunting. And again, just a beautiful bird, as you can see. And then the fourth thing wildlife needs is they, they need space. Uh, you know, we talked about earlier, just like us, we need food, water, cover. So we need, we need, uh, we need food to eat every day. We need water to eat every day and we need cover to keep us out of the elements. And so we need all that stuff in a space that gives us plenty of room to feel comfortable around and different birds. Again, I, I talk about this generally just because I don't know where everybody lives and each place, like someone mentioned that uh, don't have those in, 
in the Northeast on the, uh, on the painted buntings. Pat mentioned that. And just like you don't have uh, those birds in the no Northeast, I've got to talk about birds in general because I don't know what birds everybody has. And so each area has different birds. And then in those areas, each bird has different space requirements in terms of what makes them feel comfortable. Now, is I think it's unreasonable to think that if you provide all these habitat elements for, for birds in your own backyard, that you're going to attract just every bird that's around in your area, but you will attract more. Uh, but in some of the reasons, maybe you may provide food and water, the food they need and the water that they need, and you may provide the cover they need, but they may not have the space. They may just feel uncomfortable in such a confined area uh, of what your backyard may be. And again, it's the amount of physical space that each species requires to thrive. You know, if you, I, I use turkeys a lot as an example because I probably know more about turkeys than just about any other species of wildlife. But uh, turkeys need that, you know, especially out west where I used to live in northwest Texas, uh, Rio Grande turkeys, they need about probably three or four square miles to survive. That's the space requirement for them. An English sparrow, on the other hand, may only need a couple thousand square feet to survive. And so each animal, each bird species has a different space requirement. And so if you can keep that in mind as you're designing your backyard habitats, uh, you'll undoubtedly, undoubtedly increase the number of bird species you have in your backyard. And then, you know, ultimately you can't do much about the space requirements, particularly regarding migrating birds. Well, all you can do there is provide food, water, cover, and then just provide them a stopover place as they come through migrating like the painted bunting. Uh, I'd only see those about a month, month and a half out of every year. And so all I really hope to do is not keep them there, but just slow them down long enough when they're coming through my area that I could get some good photographs of them. You know, there's a couple of bird species that come to mind that I would see uh, in my area and I never could figure out how to make them slow down enough. But one was a, uh, where I used to live a couple of years ago, one was an Oriole species, beautiful orange bird orange and black. And I try every year to get photographs of those things and just never could. And then last year, uh, I discovered on my new property I bought where our house hopefully is finished this week and we'll be moving in next week. Uh, I saw, I started seeing painted buntings early in the, or, or late in the spring and early in the summer. And I kept trying to get pictures of those things either, but could never make them down, slow down long enough to get them. So, uh, some birds you just can't do much about. And, and in that case, you just enjoy seeing them and, enjoy spending time in their close proximity and learning more about them as they pass through. And again, these are, so the Robin there on the left, you can see that's kind of at the edges of my yard where it starts to get a little wild. And uh, that, that picture there was, that's an artificial roost that was brought in from the land on. And then again, the, the rock on the sparrow on the right, as well as the post on the Cardinal on the right, they were all brought in. And I think if, if you can tell, you're starting to see a pattern. I really like those really, really clean backgrounds. And uh, so I would always think about where I wanted my, uh, where I wanted my perches to be in order to get those backgrounds. And then Heather says, I know that the distance from the bird affects the bokeh. You have beautiful bokeh. Approximately what kind of distance to the background that you have? Uh, I'll try to explain this. I've included this information on a couple of webinars I did in the past. It is not in this one, but in general, if you can understand this concept, the, to get those really out of focus backgrounds, you have to have a background that's relatively far away from the subject and then the, the subject relatively close to your to your camera. So the, the closer that the subject moves to the background, the less out of focus the background is going to be. And so uh, the distance on the background for these, as long as I didn't have a, you know, a tree or something else, something or some other kind of object sticking up within the 10 or 15 feet behind the birds, it would kind of give me the out of focus highlights I wanted. Typically what you're looking at, say, for example, of the Cardinal there, that background there may be probably, I don't know, 50 yards away till kind of the rest of the grassland starts. And these may be little bitty pockets, isolated pockets of, of, a, of a clearing through the trees that you could see. And I'll talk in a little bit about how you can improve your backgrounds, even if you have limited amount of space that you're working with. And so, uh, again, to get these backgrounds like this, it's a function of how close your subject is to your lens. Or it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually three things. It's the kind of lens you use because it's hard to get uh, backgrounds like this when you're using a wide angle lens. But you can do it with a 200 millimeter lens and up. So it's the kind of lens you use. 
the distance between your subject and the lens and then the distance between the subject and the background. And that's an easy concept to practice. On one of the last webinars, I'd mentioned that if you go get a little stuffed animal, a teddy bear of some kind, and set it on your on your back deck or something, and then just move it around and see how keep keep your aperture on your camera the same. Use a two or three hundred millimeter lens and just move it around to see how the distance from the from the animal from the stuffed animal to the background, uh, how when it changes, it affects the the background highlights that you get. So, Heather, I hope that answers that question. And then arrangement. That's the last habitat requirement that we talked about. So food, water, cover, space. And then the last one is arrangement. And arrangement is the relation of food, water, cover to one another. And then the, and if as long as it's within this prescribed space, uh, if you think about it, Every one of us, like I go to a local store in town called Brookshire's that's, that's for groceries when we go grocery shopping. And the reason is the arrangement of that store where I get where we get our food as a family is a lot handier than to go, say, to go to a Kroger that's uh, 35 or 40 miles away in another town. And so or the restaurants we choose to eat at most of the time are closer to our house or, or closer to our cover than what some other restaurant that maybe we could drive all the way to Dallas and, and eat it, eat it someplace down there would be. And so the arrangement ref, refers to those, th again, refers to those, those first three food, water, cover, and the relation to one another. And wildlife you are just like us. They want to be able to get to food and water and back to cover in the most efficient manner possible, because for them, for us, it's a matter of convenience for wildlife species. It's a matter of life and death, especially when you're a little bird about that tall, and everything in the world is trying to eat you. You're at the bottom of the, of the food chain. You need to have food and water that's fairly close to cover. And so you can manipulate those things. You can move them around. Remember, we talked about the things that uh, were used to destroy wildlife can enhance them. And that was the axe, cow, plow, and fire and gun. And although we, we admit we can't use the fire and gun in our own backyard, but the but the concepts of the axe and being able to plant trees in a certain place and maybe remove brush from another place to improve the arrangement, you can actually do that. Uh, and then the cow and the plow manipulating the land use and how in, in, in introducing food bearing plants to the landscape can help that arrangement quite a bit. And doing something like that, I've started some rudimentary work, not only on my own backyard, but my property in general. And I'm already starting to see at least anecdotally the number of wildlife species going up because I'm making things more handy for them. I'm making things where it's uh, it's easy for them to go from their loafing or their roosting or their nesting cover to find food or to find water. And a lot of times it's just a it's just a simple case of not doing a lot of wholesale plantings or a lot not doing not doing a lot of wholesale habitat manipulations. It's just providing food and water. And so once you can start providing that in an arrangement that satisfies wildlife, you're automatically going to see a whole lot more animals. And then I say here, each species is different in the terms of their arrangement, but there's also a lot of overlap too. So cardinals and mockingbirds and uh, say the painted buntings may have some slightly different arrangement requirements, but it overlaps enough where if you provide just the basics for a number of animals, you're going to have a lot of animals come around because there's going to be enough overlap in their arrangement requirements where you'll have multiple animals using it. And, you know, we talk about birds, but the, the truth is the if you start managing intensely for one species, there's a carryover where you benefit other species as well. You know, in the physical sense, we're taught that uh, Newton's third law of motion, that for you, every action there's an equal and opposite reaction and that's true in the in the physical sense but in the natural sense for every reaction that you provide whether good or bad there's many reactions that that reverberate from that and so if you were to provide food and water and a good reliable source of food and water for for one species of wildlife you're going to benefit a whole lot of other species of wildlife too not only from from other birds, but also mammals and also uh, all the bugs and stuff that, that help keep this grand food web alive. And so uh, it goes back to that, even though you, each species is different, if you just do something, there's enough overlap, you're gonna benefit a lot of species. 
And then again, you can provide all this in a suitable arrangement in your own backyard, which was going to increase the number of animals that you'll get there. And then here's a few photo tips. Before I go any further, does anyone have any questions about anything I've talked about so far? Food, water, cover, anything like that? Any specific photo questions about any of the, any of the slides that we've looked at so far or any of the pictures I've taken and, and how I went about taking them? I'd be glad to break that down as well. Okay, so if no one has any questions, uh, let's go ahead and move on to photo tips. So I mentioned this a little bit before, but arrange your perches. If you're going to start start the process of managing for birds in your own backyard, arrange your perches where they, you take advantage of early morning or late evening light. Uh, again, I say that re in real general terms because I can't, everyone's backyard is different. It's oriented different. But if you've got a place that looks better in the morning, arrange your, your habitat uh, elements in that place where you're going to be able to take advantage of that early morning light or the same thing is true in late in the evening. Now, this is the thing that I plan to do a lot more of this year, grow flowers or bring in potted plants to add color to otherwise bland backgrounds. So if your black background may be just a privacy fence, you can add color to that by growing sunflowers along the edge of your fence or just bringing in potted plants and setting them, hanging them from the, uh, from the fence. And because it's out of focus, you may not be able to see a whole lot of, detail in the pots or how it's hung but you can't see that color and uh, there's a lot of these pictures that that you see that I took in this presentation that have you know well sort of in my opinion bland colors let me go forward from here and I'll show you a few examples that one's not bad I like the green in that one a lot of these that I showed you today were like that one where they were kind of brown and I just, I never really did add much, add, added much to the background. And even these, uh, pretty, the, the backgrounds to me are nice, but the colors are pretty bland, but it would have been easy for me. That one, the background's not bad. It'd be easy for me to pre-think about it and add something of a little bit of color in the background. I've even seen hummingbird photographers, which is ingenious. And I've done a little bit of this on other projects I've worked on where they'll take poster board and just put splotches of color on it and then put, make that the background. So even though it's in the background and it'll be out of focus, you won't be able to tell much detail about it, but it adds just enough of that kind of artificial bokeh to be able to, to provide color in an image like you see here of this morning dove. There's just not a whole lot of color in the background. Background looks nice, but it might look a little nicer if it had a little bit of, of yellow uh, or something like up here in one of the corners. And then Sue says, uh, I'm not sure what she meant by that, especially good for a natural hummingbird food source. Oh, I think you're talking about planting flowers and stuff. So yeah, that's exactly right. And so again, one of the photo tips, if you grow flowers and stuff, it's something with color in your own backyard. Not only will you improve your backgrounds, but it also gives you another species, plant species and something pretty that you can practice your photographic skills on uh, year round. And then here's a big thing for me. If you decide to feed birds, feed year round uh, because they'll become a little bit dependent. Just like if, if you've got a, if you've got a big, uh, if I've got a big oak tree on my, in my, on my property and that thing produces a lot of acorns every year, wildlife is going to get accustomed to coming to that tree every year and to be able to eat from it, eat the bounty that that tree provides. And so if you're the one providing the bounty in your own backyard in suburban, wherever, uh, one thing I tell everybody to do is if you decide to feed, only feed them high quality food, uh, stuff you can go buy from a local feed store. Uh, and then no, uh, oops, hang on a second. There we go. Only something you can buy in the local feed store, but don't, don't feed them bread or any kind of scraps like that. Only feed them high quality food that they can, they can digest accordingly. Having some issues here. So, okay, there we go. Now this video I'm gonna show you, uh, first time I've tried to show a video on this platform, so I think the sound will work. But this video I'm gonna show you is a little backyard habitat project I did at my own house in the house where I used to live. So uh, 
We'll see if this works. Just a few minutes into the sit, and I've already seen a ton of wildlife out of this water hole. I had an armadillo come in to get a drink of water. Western meadowlarks, mockingbirds, cardinals, some birds, I don't even know what they are, have all came in to get a drink of water. I hear a northern flicker outside the blind right now. I'm hoping some quail will come by and even a roadrunner. I've seen them at this water hole lately. But this water hole, what makes it so attractive to the wildlife is it may be the only one for a few hundred acres around. And so they're all flocking to here to get a drink of water before they go off to bed for the night. But here's the crazy part. I'm right in my own backyard. When you live in a semi-arid climate, water isn't inherently abundant. So when I built my house, I was dismayed at all the water that ran off the roof in a rainstorm. That water just ran off into the pasture and wasn't necessarily providing much of a benefit to the wildlife on the property. Now for walking literally 50 feet from my back door and setting up on this water hole, this has really been a tough day to beat, or a tough afternoon to beat. I've seen all kinds of little songbirds coming to drink water. Saw an armadillo early on, got some good pictures of him. Uh, I've been seeing a roadrunner come into this water hole and hoping he would come back, but I never saw him come back today. Roadrunner's a little bit skittish. He might have seen this blind and and, and shot away from it but these small birds didn't seem to mind i set up the blind uh came back about five minutes later with my gear they were all back into the brush and then as soon as i settled in the blind they all flew back in so uh sun's getting low light's really great right now uh i maybe have about 10 or 15 minutes left of good light to photograph before all the birds go to bed. So I'm hoping the roadrunner still comes. I'm hoping some bald white quail come and drink out of here because, again, I saw some earlier today, about 10 of them. They were all lined up next to each other drinking water, and that would be a really cool shot if I can ever get it. But uh, I'll definitely be back here a lot more often. You know, setting up a place in the backyard is just a real good opportunity. Whether you live in town or live in the country like I do, it's just a real good opportunity to... Uh, get wildlife in whether you've got a feeder or whether you've got a water source they're going to come eat they're going to come drink and uh it's just giving me a lot of good photographic opportunities today at my house i diverted the water from the roof through underground drainage pipes that flow the rainwater from the roof into the pond the result is a small oasis in an otherwise dry area as a result the wildlife flocks to the pond On any given day, I see deer, turkeys, pigs, coyotes, a host of songbirds, armadillos, and rabbits drinking water from around the edge. The fun part is trying to guess what we'll see next. All right, I think, uh, and, and that project I just showed you, a little ambitious. I mean, I know everyone can't do that, but, uh, and so that pond I built was huge. It was probably, I don't know, two or 300 square feet in size. Uh, but I had the space to do it. But, you know, again, if you if you have just a little small backyard koi pond or, or just a bird bath or something else that's gonna provide water for wildlife, uh, that was the key limiting factor in my area. And so, as you think about backyard bird photography, and you think about uh, what it takes to attract birds to your to your backyard so you can photograph them. One of the things that's key to think about is kind of do an analysis and what's lacking. You know, you may have a bird, you may have a little koi pond or something else already in the backyard or a bird bath. But if you like food, that food's going to be the limiting factor that's going to bring them there. So as you uh, as you think about the animals and you watch the animals and kind of learn them, they'll, 
they'll they'll let you know what they're lacking. And uh, but again, it's a rewarding way, and and it's something that I've just started on as far as from a small time scale. I've been doing it on a bigger scale on my property for a while, but in terms of really trying to make an effort to photograph this stuff without just having to go very far from my house is one of the things I'm really really keen on. And these are some of the strategies I've used to be successful so far. Uh, does anybody have any other questions for me as we go through this? Okay. Well, for more information, uh, you can see there's a link there. And if you, if you uh, lose this link or something, it's a link for the National Wildlife Federation. It's just some strategies and some advice on developing a, uh, doing some wildlife gardening in your own backyard. And uh, if you follow that, if you take a look at that link right there, it's nwf.org slash garden hyphen for hyphen wildlife slash create. It'll give you some pretty good strategies there. And a lot of this stuff we talked about today, I learned from websites like that early on. And uh, if you have any further questions as we go through, as you get further on into your journey, whether it's about backyard wildlife or gardening for backyard wildlife or backyard bird photography, or photography in general, please feel free to send me an email at russell at russellgraves.com. And as others in the group can tell you, sometimes I get a little behind uh, on returning emails, but you, I almost always return emails. And I say almost always because I might have forgotten one or two in, in the past, but I try to be pretty diligent in responding to any questions that I get sent. So uh, feel free to reach out. We got a, I think we had a couple of questions come in. Uh, Heather says, I see you're shooting on a gimbal. I'd love to try one. Yeah, gimbals, by the way, Heather, uh, are really nice for big lenses. That They just help stabilize that lens and help make them easier to balance and easier to move. And and uh, they've been a big help for me as I've, as, since I've, ha I've had one for probably maybe 15 years. But they've been a big help for me to get a lot of shots that I probably otherwise couldn't have gotten. And then uh, Sue says the Audubon Society also has suggestions for native plants to attract birds. And they do. And that's a good point. Native plants are always the best plants in which to plant. Uh, and every area has plants that thrive different in their area. Uh, where I used to live, mesquite trees and uh, yucca and prickly pear thrive because of a semi-arid climate. But where I live now, oak trees and ash trees and cottonwoods, it's a wetter area and they thrive more. And so one of the things I'm constantly trying to do, and it helps me out as a naturalist, not only as a photographer, but as a naturalist, one thing I'm always trying to do is learn plants that I don't already know and just helps me be better at, at being a good steward for wildlife and being, uh, it, because if I'm a good steward for wildlife, it makes my job as a wildlife photographer be a lot easier. Uh Jerry said, best I've seen on the subject. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. That's awfully nice for you to say. And then Laurie asked, can you tell us about the hide you're using? Yeah, and I should have mentioned that. I think I mentioned that on one of the slides I had on the photo tips. I think I just glossed over that. Or maybe, I, yeah, right there, buy a blind. And so in the video, uh, you see that I was using a blind. And the blinds I use, is, you can go to Bass Pro Shops and buy them. And, and that's usually where I get mine from. They're just a little pop-up blind that a single person can set in. Uh, they cost probably 60 or 70 bucks. They're not real expensive, but they go up really quick and they take down really quick. And there's also a company now called Tragopan, and it's T-R-A-G-O-P-A-N. That is, uh, Tragopan is making photography-specific blinds, but they're a little more expensive. But those little single-person pop-up blinds, I feel like, work pretty good for what I need them for. And then... Uh, Thank you, James, for your, your message there. And then Ashton says, at the very beginning of your presentation, there was a dove in flight. Looked like a strobe was used. I think you're talking about that one. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so sometimes serendipity plays a little bit of role in, in being able to get nice photographs. And uh, when I took this picture, there wasn't a strobe used, first of all. I, I'm I'm not a huge fan of using strobes in wildlife photography. I've done it before, but I'm just typically not a real me personally. And this is just kind of a, a, a my creative sensibilities. I'm not a real big fan of just the way it looks. Uh, other people can make it look great. I've just never been able to. But this bird here was actually I, one of the things I, I did on my property was created a 
just a little wheat field, you know, just wheat like they make bread from. And uh, but I grew mine. It was probably 2000 square feet in size and it would attract wildlife to come eat on the wheat, the young wheat. And then it would grow up and make seeds. And I had my own little, you know, natural bird feeder out there that I could photograph from. And so that time of year, turkeys would always show up. And so I was out there actually photographing turkeys. And uh, a, uh, this dove was one dove flew in and landed in front of me and I missed it. And then I happened to see another dove sitting in the tree using the loafing cover. It was just resting there. And when it got ready to fly down, literally I pointed the camera at it and it locked autofocus quick enough. And I shot three pictures of that bird landing. And that was to me, that was probably the most dynamic one. I just like the, the tail feathers fanned out and I like the pose of the wings and all that. And, uh, uh, again, sometimes you get lucky Ashton and that's the case in this picture right there. So well, after you saw the video, you can tell some of the pictures like this one right here, they were taken at my little backyard watering hole that I made for wildlife. This one was taken there too. And all I did when I, when I built that was just went around and on some neighbor's properties and picked up a bunch of rocks. And I bought a little bit of rock from the concrete company in town to fill in the gaps and, uh, and made the water hole. That picture was right there around the water hole. A lot, a lot of these pictures you see were right there close to that water hole. That picture was by the water hole. Because every day, especially in the summertime, there'd be there'd just be birds and birds and, uh, and armadillos and all kinds of animals coming in to drink out of that. Brenda asked, what settings do you use and do you shoot in raw? I do shoot in raw. Uh, you know, of course, the settings I use are, are typically... Uh, depending on the lighting conditions of the of the picture that I took. But in general, I can tell you this. Uh, I shared this a couple of weeks ago on a webinar. I can tell you empirically, 80% of the pictures I've ever taken, because I've, I've crunched the data, 80% of the pictures I've ever taken, I took them on aperture priority mode with my cameras. And so I shoot aperture priority mode 80% of the time. I shoot manual about 15% of the time. Uh, but aperture priority most likely on all these, my sweet spot on ISO is between 400 and 800. So I can probably tell you that most of these pictures were shot in that range as well. And then usually I try to shoot as wide open as aperture as I can get like these, like that lens you saw me using in the video is a 500 millimeter lens. I had a 1.4 teleconverter on it. So it makes it like a 720, I think, if my math is correct, which is probably not. So if you want to check me on my math, feel free to tell me if I'm wrong on that but I think it makes it 720 millimeter at F 5.6. And so likely most all these pictures were taken at F 5.6 or at, uh, or at F eight, just one or two stops from being wide open. Cause again, like this picture here, I like the, I just like those really out of focus backgrounds. And by the way, while we're on the subject, if you look at this background here, that, that background to this dove is relatively far off, which gives you that really out of focus background, nondescript background. And if you look at, well, let me back up a little more. There's a good illustration because the, the rock is, is tilting away up and away from the water. The rock in relation to the turkey is not that far away. And so the rock is even more distinct just because of the distance, like we talked about earlier. The distance of the background from the subject really makes a huge difference in the way the background looks. But I couldn't do any better there, so that's the that's the absolutely best we could do. But the background is not distracting. But if I had a background like the morning dove uh, for this picture, it'd be even better for me. But you can see there, uh, that's a good illustration. Some of the limbs of that mesquite tree are not very far behind that painted bunting, and so they're not really out of focus. But the 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 background at large is even further back. So it's really soft and out of focus. Uh, Brent asked a good question. Let me get a little further in this, Brent, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'm going to get back to that one link and I'll tell you that answer. Cause this is, it's, I'll tell you how I built that thing. I wish I had a still photo of it on this presentation. So we could, uh, we could talk about it more. So I dug that hole for that water hole uh, probably I dug it with my little compact tractor that I've got. It's probably, it was probably a couple of feet deep at the deepest because I couldn't, I wanted to build it a singular depth, but I couldn't really accomplish that because of topography and because of, uh, uh, just the limitations I had with the tractor I was using. 
And so it's probably a couple of feet deep at the deepest. But what you can't see is uh, Just a few let me go past that. Sit. What you can't see is underneath all that rock is I put a liner in it so it would be more efficient at holding water so if i just dumped of course if i dumped all the water out on the uh on the dirt the dirt would soak up most of it and it just would hardly ever hold water and so by putting a liner in it i was able to to retain water longer and which is really key for getting wildlife to come in and so i just covered the uh uh liner up with rocks just to hide it now some of the bottom that you, you could still see the liner down there in the underwater but for the most part you couldn't and the 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 crazy thing about the liner I use, you can go buy rubber from these uh, pond supply companies, but it was pretty expensive. And so I found a place online that recycled uh, trade show tarps. You know, you go into a trade show and you see these gigantic tarps hanging on the walls and it's they're selling some kind of product. And I actually bought one of those from that company. And so I think I paid fifty dollars for this. I think it was I think it was probably 30 feet by 60 feet, something like that. This huge trade show tarp. But it was a, it was of a from a photography trade show, so it had a giant camera right in the middle. And then when people would fly over and they could see the bottom of it, they could see the camera underwater. Because uh, I flew over my house a couple of times, and that's when I noticed it. You could see the camera underwater in the in the bottom of that pond. And so uh, I can't remember the name of the company, but if you look at like used trade show tarps, they work pretty good for using as a liner for a pond, and that way you can recycle that that uh that material as well as, as uh, it, it did a great job. It was, it was probably about as durable as a rubber liner. It, I mean, the whole time I was there, I probably had before I sold that house and moved and bought the new place. Uh, it probably probably had it there five years and it was durable and deer would walk down in it and they never punctured it. So it was, uh, it always worked out pretty well. And again, the way it supplied water, it just reminds you is almost entirely supplied by every time it would rain, Water would run off the roof, run into the gutters, and I had the gutters popped underground to flow into the pond. And so it would capture all the rainfall off my roof. And you may not know this, but uh, for every thousand gallon, or I'm sorry, for every thousand square feet of roof space you have, an inch of rain will produce about 625 gallons of water. And so calculate 625, calculate your roof size. Uh, you know, my roof was bigger than a thousand square foot in the house that you saw in that video. And I think I had almost 2000 square feet of roof. And so 2000 square feet of roof, every inch of rain and produced hundred or 1200 gallons of water roughly. And then times that by about 24 inches of rain a year. And that one roof captured a lot of water from it. And so that was a rainfall storage. You know, the old timers, uh, here in Texas used to build cisterns that they would store water in when the, when, when the times would get dry and essentially, I built an outdoor system that I would store rainfall water in and uh, provided a benefit to, to wildlife in my area and provided a benefit to me just as a constant source of photography subjects. So uh, hope that helps, Brenda. And uh, if your husband, uh, give me his phone number and I'll call him and encourage him for you to help you because it's pretty cool when you can build something like that. Okay, I'm going to put that information back up again. Uh there's the there's the National Wildlife Federation uh, website for if you want to learn more about backyard habitats for wildlife. And then there's my email address if uh, if you want have any more questions for me. But it's twelve fifty three. We're about done with our hour. If no one has any further questions, I'll wait for just a second. But if no one has any further questions, I just want to say thanks again for joining us. Uh, I'm about to head to Alaska for a, a little while to go on a backcountry journeys tour on Northern lights and bald eagles up there. So uh, when I get back, I'll be doing another webinar. I believe it's on the door. Well, it's two weeks from today. I think it is. I think it's on the 30th, but it's kind of a recap of my recent trip to, to the Florida Everglades, just kind of a slideshow and talking through some of the pictures. So hope you'll join me on that. I uh, hope you'll join us again in the future. And I don't see any further questions coming in. So appreciate everyone's attention. And again, just if you think of anything after this webinar is over, follow up with me. Okay, here's a question. Pat says, what advice do you have for catching birds in flight? I've got a whole presentation about that I've done before, and I'll usually do it on the birds in flight tours that we do. But my advice is, is uh, pretty simple. I can make this pretty straightforward. Number one, 
uh, use a higher ISO, like ISO 800. Not, I don't try to go 3200 or something like that, but ISO 800 and bright skies will usually give me a fast enough shutter speed. Number two, and this is a key thing a lot of people don't think about. Most telephoto lenses, well, I say most, I know a lot of telephoto lenses I see have a focus limiter on the side of the lens. And what that focus limiter does was is instead of that lens having to hunt through its entire focal range, you can limit it to only focus like, say, 15 meters and beyond. And I'm no optical physicist, and I can't tell you why you do this, but if you look at your lens and you look at the scale, most of the focusing movement is between the close-up focus and 15 meters. If you get beyond 15 meters, there's just a little sliver of space that lens needs to move to obtain focus. And that's one of the key things there on birds in flight. Uh, you can set that focus limiter where that lens isn't trying to hunt through its whole range. And when it's not trying to hunt through its whole range of focusing, it'll lock on fo flying birds a lot better. And then the third advice to give you is pick a bird when they're far out and start tracking them all the way in and stay with that same bird. It's hard to do when you're in an area where a lot of birds are flying around, but if you'll stick with one bird until it lands and then go pick another bird, your shots go way up. So I always advise people to pick one early, watch it all the way in and then take pictures of it as it comes in and just lay down on the button as it comes in, take lots and lots and lots of pictures. And, uh, if you can follow those four main things, use a high, use like a 800 ISO, uh, set the focus limiter, pick a bird early and stick with it, and then shoot lots of frames. I never get 100% of birds in focus perfectly, but it, it, sh it certainly increases my uh, the number of keepers that I, I, I have later on. And the fifth thing really is just practice. Practice a lot before you even get out there. And that practice may be the dog running around your yard or neighborhood birds like we've been talking about today, but the practice is really the key thing. All right. Well, hey, again, thanks, guys, for having me and uh, or being with me today. And if there's no further questions, I'm going to go ahead and run. I think if you'll check back, I don't know how often they they or how quick they turn these around, but the good folks back at the Backcountry Journeys offices will post these to the Backcountry Journeys YouTube channel. And uh, if you need to follow up, but again, if you have any other questions, just send me an email. I'll be glad to help. Take care, guys.